Good morning. Alisa and Scott and I are with you today, and we're excited to bring to you Lesson 8 of our Sabbath School, which is Jesus, the Mediator of the New Covenant. And so before we jump into our today's lesson, Scott, would you lead us in prayer, please? Sure. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the privilege to dive into your word tonight. Father, you know these words from Hebrews are so important. The media, um, Christ, our mediator, is central to the entire plan of salvation, to the Bible, to our, to our lives. Help them to take first place in our lives and help your Holy Spirit to um, put words in our mouth and have us to uh, explain things correctly and speak through us tonight. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. All right, our memory verse comes to us from Hebrews 8, 6. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that has much more excellent than the old covenant. He mediates is better since it's enacted on better promises. And we're going to get in today to what some of those better promises are. <clears throat> but one of the key issues in this better covenant is that Jesus led a perfect life. And then by dying in our place, Jesus mediated a new, better covenant between us and God. Through his death, Jesus canceled the penalty of death that our trespasses demanded and made possible the new covenant. So we see this truth explained in Hebrews 10, 5 through 10. Uh, verse 5, Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body that you have prepared for me. And burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do your will, O God. And so that was Christ's mission on earth, was to do the will of his Father. And then jumping to verse 9, then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. But that will <coughs> have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. So we see Jesus manifested this perfect obedience. And when Paul talks about it, he's looking back at Psalms 40. And King David wrote um, this about Christ. And so here is what he had to say. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He also brought me out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon the rock and established my steps. He put a new song in my mouth, praise to the Lord. Many will see it and fear it and will trust the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust and does not respect the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. Many, O Lord my God, are your wonderful works which you have done, and your thoughts toward us cannot be recounted to order, to recounted to you in order. If you would declare and speak of them, the more than can be numbered. And verse 6, 7, and 8 are very key to this. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire. And we see this in Hebrews. We see this in, in both the Old and New Testament. God did not desire uh, sacrifice and offering. Your ears you have opened, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require. Then I said, Behold, I come in the scroll of the book. It is written of me. I will delight to do your will, O oh my God, in your law is in your in my and your law is within my heart. So we see <clears throat> that Jesus had the law, he had everything within God's heart and his heart, which were the same, and um, this is part of what made his um, sacrifice so complete. I have proclaimed the good news of righteousness in the great assembly. Indeed, I do not restrain my lips, O Lord. You yourself know. And so um, 
as we finish, I'll let you finish reading uh, the rest of <clears throat> Psalms on your own. But just um, in the following, in, in the uh, last few sentences, it says, let all those who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. Let your love, your salvation say continually, the Lord be magnified. But I am poor and needy, yet Lord thinks upon me. And you are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, oh my God. And so uh, the Bible commentary set has this to say about, <clears throat> in volume 7, about uh, Psalms 47 and 8. Referring to the Messiah's desire to render to God total obedience, behold, I have come in the scroll of the book. It is written of me, I delight to do your will, O God. Your law is within my heart. The original text phrase, to do your will, described moral obedience to the will of God. The author of Hebrews uses the phrase to show that the sacrifice of Christ fulfilled the will of God in providing an accountable atonement with that the animal sacrifices had not provided. So for Paul, again, this psalm acquired special significance with the incarnation of Jesus. Jesus embodied the obedience of the new covenant. He is our example. We have been saved not only because of his death, but because of his perfect obedience. And Desire of Ages <clears throat> has this to say. Even before humanity, even before he took humanity upon him, he saw the whole length of the path he must travel in order to save the lo that which was lost. Every pang that rent his heart, every insult that was heaped upon his head, every privation that he was called to endure, he was open to his view before he laid aside the crown and royal robe and stepped down from the throne to clothe divinity with humanity. The path from the manger to Calvary was all before his eyes. He knew the anguish that would come before him. He knew it all, and he said, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me. I will delight to do thy will. O oh my God, yea, the law is in my heart. So Christ knew what he was stepping into, and yet he was willing to do whatever it took. Even before him, he saw the result of his mission. His earthly life, so full of toil and self-sacrifice, was cheered by the prospect that he would not have to have all this travail for naught. By giving his life for the life of men, he would win back the world to the loyalty of God. Although the baptism of blood must be received, although the sins of the world were to weigh upon him his innocent soul, although the shadow of an unspeakable woe was upon him, yet for the joy that was set before him, he chose to endure the cross and despised the shame. And so we see that this Jesus made a more perfect covenant, more perfect sacrifice, and a more perfect mediator for us. So, Elisa, mm -hmm. <clears throat> let's talk about Sunday's lesson, The Need of a New Covenant. Okay, very good. Yep. So in Sunday's <clears throat> lesson, we will study more specifically the new priesthood component of the new covenant. For a foundational understanding of why there was a need for a new covenant and a new priesthood, let's review why a covenant between God and his people was required to begin with. It all had to do with mankind's sin problem and our inability to live a life perfectly in harmony with God's law. Sin separated humans from God because righteousness and evil cannot coexist. In Matthew 6, 24, Jesus said, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. No one person from Adam after his fall to those of us living today have been able to give to able to live a sinless life. In Romans 3:23, we read that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So, in order to bring the fallen human race back into unity with God and his law, 
It was necessary for God to institute a plan to deal with our sin problem once and for all. This was the covenant or the promise made between God and man. First given to Adam and Eve after their fall, then renewed with Abraham, David, and again through Moses. The covenant promise of a coming Messiah who would restore the breach between God and man was then and is still good news. Without this covenant promise, we would have no hope of overcoming sin, nor would we have hope of reconciling our relationship with God and living with him for eternity. The Sunday's lesson discusses the change of priesthood under the new covenant, which replaced the old order of Levitical priesthood that had been commanded by God and established by Moses for ancient Israel. Let's read Hebrews 7, verses 11 to 19 for an introduction. Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also a change of law. For he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe from which no man has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. And it is yet far more evident if... In the likeness of Melchizedek, there arises another priest who has come, not according to the law of a fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life. For he testifies, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, there is an annulling of the former commandment, because of its weakness and, pro and unprofitableness, for the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope, through which we draw near to God. So there are a couple of key points that we learn in this text. First, the Levitical priesthood order was not perfect in its ability to deal with the sin problem. A new order of priesthood, according to the order of Melchizedek, was required under the new covenant. The Levitical priests were of, oh, excuse me, what were the weaknesses of that Levitical priesthood? Well, first of all, the Levitical priests were of a fallen human nature like you and me. They were prone to sin and subject to death. As such, they had to offer sin offerings for themselves as well as for the people. And because their lives ended in death, they could not fulfill the continual offering of sacrifice and intercession required under the new covenant. In Hebrews 7, 23, and again in verses 26 to 27, we, we learn more about this. It says, also there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. And in 26 and 27, speaking of Jesus, it says, For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily, as those high priests, to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. So another point that we learned from uh, what we studied in, in Hebrews 7, 11 to 19, was that the gifts and sacrifices the Levitical priests offered were imperfect. Hebrews 10, 4 says, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sin. The Levitical priesthood was a shadow or a type pointing forward to Christ, the antitype and true high priest, 
who through his sinless life and death obtained the perfection required of the new covenant priesthood. Well, the Levitical priesthood could not obtain perfection. It did serve a high purpose for Israel, one of mediation, instruction, correction, and officiating the services of offerings and gifts. Their ministry was designed to protect people from idolatry, reveal God's mercy and goodness towards them, and point them to the future ministry of Jesus, the coming Messiah, who was a fulfillment of their ministry. <clears throat> and a third point that we learn about um, in the first passages we read in Hebrews 7 was that a change of priesthood required a change in the priesthood law. The Lord had commanded Moses to establish the priesthood through Aaron and the tribe of Levi. You can go and read about that in Numbers 3. The priesthood was to be theirs for a perpetual state. That is stated in Exodus 29.9. And the Lord also commanded that the outsider who comes near shall be put to death. You can read about that in, November, in Numbers 3.10. In order for Christ to fulfill the new covenant priesthood, this law had to be changed because Christ came from the tribe of Judah. Therefore, God the Father testified an oath, which we read in Hebrews 7:17, 7, saying, You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And lastly, the, another point that we had learned in Hebrews chapter 7 was that the law given through Moses was not able to overcome the sin problem and bring perfection. In Hebrews 7.19, we read, For the law made nothing perfect. And to expound on that, if we look at Acts 13.39, it says, And by him, speaking of Jesus, Everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. So while the law provides us a perfect standard of righteousness, it cannot provide salvation. Only Christ and his righteousness can justify and redeem us from sin. So we'll hand it over to Scott, I think, for new and renewed. Yep. All right, we'll start anew and renew ourselves with fresh knowledge from Hebrews. So um, the Hebrew term for new and renewed was hadasha. And this term had both of those meanings. And so in, in this lesson, we'll be contrasting um, the new and renewed covenant. So the new cov covenant versus the old covenant. Um, and also finding out that the covenant was really renewed rather than done away with and had a new one replace it. So I remember when I went to university here, one of the things professors used to do if the exam was too difficult is they would grade on a curve, which basically meant that uh, they would take the average score and then go one standard deviation above you get a B, two standard deviations above you get an A and below so forth. So basically they would grade based on the average performance. On the other hand, God has a different grading plan which I, ra I rather like much better. So God's grading plan rather than basing it on the average student, he, he substitutes Christ's perfect grade which is 100% for your failing grade which I, I like that deal way better. So I do too. all of us, <laughs> all of us get a hundred percent on the test of Christianity. But that's only assuming we accept Christ's uh, robe of righteousness. So let's read some of the verses here. In Hebrews eight through ten, um, it says. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest of them, for I will be merciful unto the unrighteous 
and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. And then the lesson says to contrast that with uh, Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 6, and that says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And these words I command you today shall be in your heart. Um, so the question was, what does this teach us about the nature of the new covenant? Well, to me, I feel like these, these two verses or these two passages are parallel. So um, in one of them, it says that God will implant the love of God in your heart. And then the, the second one from Deuteronomy, which was really came first, um, it basically says that you are to love the Lord your God with all your strength. And I'm also reminded of the fact that um, these were the very verses that were quoted by um, the Pharisee who, whom Jesus, who, who came to Jesus and said, what, what must I do to be saved? Um, and then he, he said to love the Lord your God with all your heart and your neighbor as yourself. And Christ said, do this and you will live. So this same teaching was reinforced in the teachings of Christ in the New Testament. Um, so the, um, let's continue on. It says, the promise of a new covenant in Hebrews refers back to Jeremiah. According to Jeremiah, God's promise of a new covenant was in fact a renewal of the covenant that he had first made with Israel through Moses. It could, be, and that's in Jeremiah 31 through 34. And here I'll, I'll read that as well. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in that day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they all shall know me, from the least to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. And this is the verse that's being quoted by Paul in Hebrews that we began with. Um, it says, It could be argued then that Jeremiah 31 was not strictly speaking of a new covenant, but of a renewal and the original covenant with Israel. Um, so let's, and, and then it talks about the the Hebrew word hadasha being both having both meanings of new and renew. Thus the uh, the problem with the old covenant was not the covenant itself but it was that the people couldn't keep it. Um, and that is outlined in Hebrews 8 verses 8 and 9 um, which says because finding fault with them he says behold the days are coming says the Lord when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in that day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt because they did not continue in my covenant, I disregarded them, says the Lord. So from what I remember about the story of the people of Israel is that Moses hadn't even come down from the mountain to give them the law yet when they had already made a golden, um, a golden calf. So essentially the, the covenant, the old covenant was broken before it even started. So it was almost like a non-starter, but God, instead of giving affirmative action where you lower the standard in order to get people to get admitted to school. In this case, he did heaven action, which is bringing the people up to his standard. And so, but in order for that, you must be willing to, um, to go along with Christ's robe of righteousness. So if Israel had seen through the symbols of the coming Messiah and put their faith in him, the covenant would not have been broken. Yet, to be fair, there were many believers through the Israelite history in whom um, 
the purposes of the covenant were fulfilled and they did have their law in their hearts. And um, let's read some of those examples that are quoted here. It says in Psalms 37:30, the mouth of the righteous speaks wisdom and the tongue and his tongue talks of justice. The law of his God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. Um, and then Psalms 40, verse 8, I delight to do your will, O my God, and your law is within my heart. Um, the next one will go to Psalms 119.11, Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. And Isaiah 51.7 says, Listen to me, you who are righteous, you people in whose heart is my law. Do not fear the reproach of man, nor be afraid of their insults. Um, so we can see that it, it's the same message being given in the Old Testament as in the New Testament. And the New Covenant is the only way anybody's ever been saved. I almost feel like God was letting the, um, letting the Israelites kind of dig their own hole. So when they said, everything you said, we will obey, God's like, let's see about that. <laughs> let's see how long your obedience lasts. Apparently not too long. While Moses was up getting the law, they were building the golden calf. So um, it didn't last very long at all. So th I think that's an illustration for us as well, that we're no better than the people um, during Moses' day, the Israelites, and that were not able to keep God's law. So I think it's the, the law is to bring us to the humble place of realizing our helplessness. And I think when we're able to say with the tax collector that Jesus commended, um, you know, have mercy upon me, a sinner, we're, we're far further ahead than the Pharisee who said, well, thank you that I'm not like these other sinners around. Um, so, uh, let's see. We'll, con we'll, we'll finish up with the reading. Um, let's see, what verse did I have here? Um, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard its spots? Then may you do good who are accustomed to do evil. So, what I get out of that is that basically it's impossible for us to keep the law. But, Christ came and died for us to enable us to have our failing grade substituted as for his perfect grade. So I choose Christ 100%. Next. <laughs> All right. The new covenant has a better mediator. <clears throat> we know that. We've been studying this all quarter. Um, but we're going to start right now with Hebrews. <coughs> Excuse me. 8, 1 through 6. And this is uh, the new priestly service. And this is a little bit of repetition that we've, uh, we've read this um, scripture before, but I think it's important that we look at it again. Now, this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of majesty of heavens, a minister of the sanctuary of the true tab tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. So Christ is the head of the tabernacle that God erected, not the, not the earthly tabernacle. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one also have something to offer. For he, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to take, make the tabernacle. For he said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established or, or on better promises. So everything on this earth is just an image of what God has in heaven as far as the, the sanctuary that was here on earth. So we know that Christ is a better mediator than man, but let's look at the Greek term mesitius, M-E-S-I-T-E-S, mesitius, 
mediator, it's derived from the middle. And it talks about one who, who stands or walks in the middle. And this term is referred to as a person, one or more of the following functions. So we're, we have four functions here we're going to look at. So an arbitrator between two parties. And we know what that's like. Anyone who's ever had to go to arbitration, it's always between the two parties. Um, a negotiator or a, a broker, one who, who helps uh, work out a, a, a compromise or a, a deal. A witness in the legal sense of the word, one who stands as a surety and thus guarantees the execution of an agreement. The English term mediator is too narrow a translation for Mesites in Hebrew because it only focuses on the first two or three of the Greek term. Hebrews, however, emphasizes the fourth function. Jesus is not conceived as a mediator in the sense that he settles between disputes between father or humans or as a peacemaker who reconciles parties in disaffectionate or as a witness who certifies the existence of a contract or its satisfaction. Instead, as Hebrews explain, Jesus is the guarantor or surety of the new covenant. And we're so fortunate that Jesus is not just the mediator. He is also our high priest. He's our judge. He's our jury. He, he, co he covers all of, our, of the bases for us. So we're so blessed to have this sacrifice that he did for us. Uh, Hebrews 7.22 says, By so much more Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. Um, Hebrews um, 15, 9.15-22, For this reason he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death, for the redemption of the transgression under the first covenant, those who are called to receive the promise of eternal inheritance. So we see that through this, we have this internal, uh, eternal inheritance. And then moving on to verse 20, this is the blood of the covenant which God commanded you. Then likewise he sprinkled the blood both with blood, both the tabernacle and the vessels of ministry. And according to the law, almost all things were purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. And so Christ was our guarantor, Jesus, our guarantor. And um, in, in another sense, Jesus' exaltation in heaven guarantees that God's promises to human beings will be fulfilled. And so we see <clears throat> that Christ is this hope. He is the forerunner and has entered for us, even Jesus having become high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And, and Elisa talked about that earlier. Jesus guarantees the covenant because he has shown the, that God's promises are true. By resurrecting Jesus and seating him at the right hand, the Father has shown that he will resurrect us and bring us to him too. And that's a beautiful promise that we have, that we too will be resurrected. Jesus is a greater mediator than Moses because he ministers in the heavenly sanctuary and offered himself as a perfect sacrifice for us. And as we look at this, this comparison <clears throat> between Jesus and um, what God had asked Moses to do, we see that with Moses, uh, if we look at Exodus 34, <clears throat> 29 through 31, it says, Now it was so, when Moses came down from the Mount Sinai, and the tablets of stone of the testimony were in Moses' hand when he came down from the mountain, that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. So when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone and they were afraid to come near him. Then Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned to him. And so we see this, this um, glory is a reflection through Moses of Jesus, but, but Jesus was the glory of God. In Hebrews 1, 3, it says, who being the brightness of his glory and the expression of his image 
of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins and sat down at the right hand of his majesty. And John 1.14, he became, he became the word and dwelt among, among us. So, and then back, going back to Moses, we see that Moses um, spoke to God face to face. Um, and, and we see that, <clears throat> that what had happened, we know what had happened, but Jesus is God's word personified. In Hebrews 4, 12, and 13, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the division of soul and spirit in the joints and marrow, and is the discerner of the thoughts in the inherent heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to his eyes. So we see that <clears throat> this, everything that Moses was reflecting Christ is. And, <clears throat> and then finally we can remember that not only is Jesus our mediator, our judge, our high priest, he was here from the beginning. And he was with God and um, was here at creation. And so as you can see with his plan, he has certainly, um, he has he has certainly become a much better mediator of the new covenant. Elisa, yes, the new covenant has better promises. Uh, so, in in Tuesday's lesson, we had learned that the new covenant covenant was established on better promises. Um, so, while the rewards of the old covenant, which was a restored relationship with God and eternally dwelling with him, were the same as a new covenant, the surety of those promises could only come through Christ, which was in the new, new covenant. So we're, we will explore a few similarities and differences between the two promises. And in the interest of time, I'm going to summarize a bit. I'll give you the text and you can read it uh, thoroughly on your own. So the old covenant promise you can read about in Exodus 24, 1 to 8. And um, in, in, that, in those verses, it tells us that the Lord had commanded Moses to come up to him on the mountain, um, but that he would have to come alone, and uh, the people and, and those who had gone partially up with him could not come up near the Lord. Um, and then it, Moses went and told the people what God had said and all these things, and the people said, well, all those words which the Lord said, we will do. And after that, Moses Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord, and then he uh, rose the next morning and built an altar and offered sacrifices. And, and the verses there say he took the blood and he put it in the basins, um, and he sprinkled the altar, and he read to the people the Book of the Covenant. And the people again said, all that the Lord said, we will do in obedient, be obedient. And... Um, so then Moses sprinkled the blood on the people and said, this is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you according to all these words. So in these verses, we learn that in the old covenant, the people, because of their sin, could not come near to God. They required a mediator who, in this case, was Moses. Another thing we learned was that the covenant was not only based on God's promise to the people, but also based on the promise of the people that they would perform and be obedient to the words of the Lord. And then the third thing was that blood was required to seal and ratify the covenant. So now let's take a look and compare that against the new covenant, um, which is found in Hebrews 10, 5 to 10, then again, um, 19 and 20, and then Hebrews 8, 7 to 10. Um, at the beginning of her study, Barb had read about Hebrews 10, 5 to 10, and, and had said, um, sacrifice and offering you do not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. And, um, and again, sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings for sin you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them. Um, and then Jesus said, Behold, I, I come to do your will, O God. Uh, so it was a different, different type of sacrifice. 
Um, and then let's go and read uh, 19 and 20 of Hebrews 10. And that says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. And the last thing we'll read is Hebrews 8, 7 to 10, which says, For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second, because finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I had made with their fathers in the day that I took them and led them by the hand out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. And then verse 10 says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So we learn from the new covenant that we now can draw close to God in the holy of holies because of the blood of Jesus. And we can take our petitions straight to the throne of grace through Jesus Christ. And the second thing we learn is that the new covenant is based solely on the Lord's promise to us, that he will put his law in our minds and write it on our hearts so that we will remember it and will desire the obedience to the law, which is possible through Christ. And then the last thing that we learn there is the new covenant also required blood to seal or ratify the promise. However, this time only the perfect blood of Jesus could do that work. So the, the lesson here also uh, refers to a quote from Steps to Christ that provides further insight into why obedience to God's law and reconciliation through Christ is necessary. And that reads, The condition of eternal life is now just what it has always been, just what it was in paradise before the fall of our first parents, perfect obedience to the law of God, perfect righteousness, if eternal life were granted on any other condition short of this, then the happiness of the whole universe would be imperiled. The way would be open to sin with all of its train of woe and misery to be immortalized. Therefore, God satisfies the absolute demands of the new covenant for us because in our weakness we are unable to do this for ourselves. Instead, he gave his own precious son to come and live a perfect life so that the promises of the covenant might be fulfilled in him, then offered those promises to us by faith in Jesus. All right, Scott, um, you want to go to ver uh, Thursday? The new covenant has solved the problem of the heart. Yes. So the new covenant has solved the problem of the heart. Um, in his book called The Power of Habit, the author Charles Duhigg put forth the idea that in order to make a big change, you have to start with a small steps, and then you have to practice those steps over and over. So I think it's the same thing with God and planting his spirit into our hearts, that we have to start with very small steps. So the example, one of the examples he gives in his book is that um, the president of General Electric decided instead of focusing on bigger profits, he was going to focus on one thing, workplace safety. So everything was done to keep everything safe so that nobody would get injured. But in, in doing that, he had to upgrade the the equipment as well as do better training for the people so that everybody would be safe and that ended up yielding bigger profits so let's read now back to the Jeremiah it says the new covenant promises of Jeremiah 31 33 and Ezekiel 36 27 how are they related so let, let's read those verses um, okay so Jeremiah 3133. I had it on my previous page. I guess I should have rewritten it down so I don't have to flip back. Um, okay, so Jeremiah. 
and verse 33 it says but this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people and then again in Ezekiel it says um, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh I will put my spirit within you and, ca um, and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them so the first covenant document was written by God on tablet, uh, tables of stone and was deposited in the ark um, and the covenant okay um, and it was deposited in the Ark of the Covenant as an important witness of God's covenant with his people. However, documents in stone could be broken as in evidence by Moses uh, throwing down the law when he saw the, the people of Israel disobeying it. Um, and as Jeremiah experienced, they could be cut up and burned. But the new covenant, God will write his law in our hearts and the hearts of the people. And then it says, the heart refers to the mind, the organ of memory and understanding. And, and this is where I had to do some explaining because um, in my view, I think that equating the heart with the mind is um, not quite accurate. So I feel that this statement was a little bit imprecise. So while I agree that the heart does not mean the organ that pumps blood, but rather a structure within the brain. I think the heart refers to the seat of the emotions in the brain, which is the limbic system, whereas the mind refers more to the prefrontal cortex, so the area of reason. Um, so uh, the heart refers to our internalized emotions and experience, which lead us to decide based on our propensities rather than on impassioned re unimpassioned reason. The seat of the heart may be said, um, okay, I, I think I, I already talked about that. Thus, I would associate the heart with what has been deemed as the crocodile brain, that is the more instinctive part of the brain, um, which salespeople try to appeal to, and there's books written on the subject. Um, whereas the mind part has to do more with the cognitive ability, such as doing a math problems. So am I merely splitting hairs with this decision? In my view, this is a very important thing because if um, things were to be based purely on logical uh, understanding of the facts, then um, the Jews would not have rejected Christ, indeed the whole world. Um, so Jesus said in Matthew 6.21, For where your heart is, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This statement is the key to understanding why the Jews rejected the Messiah. There was plenty of evidence that he gave him, culminating in the resurrection of Lazarus, who had been dead for four days. No one, not even Satan, could bring back one from the dead except God alone. And God would definitely not give his power to an imposter. Thus, from a purely logical perspective, the Sanhedrin must have known that Jesus was no imposter. However, acknowledging him as the Messiah, they needed to admit that they were wrong and that they were sinners in need of repentance, which have would have offended their pride and meant that they had to reform their lives. Jesus unfolded this mystery to Nicodemus um, when he said that a man must be born again. Although Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea ultimately did humble themselves and become disciples of Christ, it would be safe to assume that most or all of the rest of the 68 members of the Sanhedrin did not have a change of heart or even if their minds were convinced. So thus, I think there, there is a difference between the heart and the mind that your mind can perceive something to be correct without your heart actually um, acknowledging it. Um, likewise, he also t took the cup... Oh, so now we're going on to the next point. Um, so let me see where the... I had to go back to there. So the promise did not simply secure access um, and to the 
access to and knowledge of the law for everyone. It also, and more important, was to bring about a change of heart. The problem of Israel was that their sin was engraved with a pen of iron and with a point of diamond on the tablet of the heart. They had a stubborn heart and therefore it was impossible for them to do the right thing. Um, and then Jeremiah did not announce a change in the law because there was a problem um, of Israel. It was not because the problem of Israel was not the law but the heart. God wanted Israel's faithfulness to be grateful response to what he had done for them. And thus he gave them the Ten Commandments um, with a historical prologue expressing his love and care for them. God wanted Israel to obey his laws as an acknowledgement that he wanted the best for them and in truth he revealed in their great deliverance from Egypt. Um, so uh, this verse here in Luke 22 20 likewise he also took the cup after supper saying this is the cup of the new covenant which is my blood which is shed for you so this is a, an important point in that the new covenant was Christ's blood and um, by accepting that we are accepting the new covenant which is going back to creating habits which are gonna put us in the in the position where we can accept um, God's righteousness and his love for us. So in conclusion, I think we have to create habits of obedience and love to God. And um, let's see, there's one, one more verse here I wanted to share. Um, now, the hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And then also Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness. So th this is what's going to happen when we have our hearts renewed, and we'll end with that. All right. Thank you. Lisa, do you have any final thoughts? Yes. Um, <coughs> I, I, I um, have this little quote from the Spirit of Prophecy. This was from... Letter 90, circa 1906, and really the theme here is Christ is our advocate. So this is, this is another part of Christ that's very important. That's part of the New Covenant. And it says, Christ is watching. He knows all about our burdens, our dangers, and our difficulties, and he fills his mouth with arguments in our behalf. He fits his intercessions to the needs of each soul as he did in the case of Peter. Our advocate fills his mouth with arguments to teach his tried, tempted ones to brace against Satan's temptations. He interprets every movement of the enemy and he orders events. So what, what a great promise that we have someone who is so involved in our salvation um, and fights on our behalf for us. So um, that, that's my summary. Thank you. Thank you. Well, my final thoughts <clears throat> come from a day with God, this day with God. <laughs> And this is, I think this is important because we've studied the wonderful gift that Christ has given us and what a so much better mediator he is for us. But I wanted to read this because I think it really sums everything up nicely, especially what we can be doing today as well. By giving his life for the world, Christ bridged the gulf that sin had made joining this sin-cursed earth to the universe of heaven as a province. God chose this world to be the theater of his mighty works of grace. Well, the sentence of condemnation was suspended over it because of the rebellion of its inhabitants, while the clouds of wrath accumulating because of the transgressions of the law of God, a mysterious voice was heard in heaven, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. Our substance and surety came from heaven, declaring that he had brought with him the vast and inestimable donation of eternal life. Pardon is offered to all who return their allegiance to the law of God. 
I want to read that again. This is so important. Pardon is offered to all who return their allegiance to the law of God. But there are those who refuse to accept, and thus saith the Lord. Satan has called this world his territory. He has, here he is, here his seat is, and he holds in allegiance to himself all who refuse to keep God's commands, who reject a plain, thus saith the Lord. They stand under the enemy's banner, for there are but two parties in the world. And we're down to that. We see that more and more now. There's only two parties in the world. All rank either under the banner of the obedient or under the banner of the disobedient. Jesus is now sending his message to a fallen world. And this is where we come in. We can help Christ share that message to a fallen world. He delights to take apparently hopeless material, those whom Satan has worked, and make them the subject of his grace. He rejoices to deliver them from the wrath which is to fall upon the disobedient. So <clears throat> this mediator, Christ, is here to save those of us who have been, and we all have been, disobedient. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we want to thank you for being our mediator. Lord, we want to thank you for the work that you're doing now in heaven. We know, Father, that you are fighting for us. When we come to you and we pour our hearts out to you, you are there to transform us, to forgive us, and to give us the strength we need to make it from day to day. As we see that you're coming fast approaching, Lord, we just pray that you would give us each the strength that we need to fulfill your work and your word. So thank you for being with us today. Thank you for this, this lesson. And thank you for your almighty love. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath, Doll.